Okay, um, boys and girls, I'm going to continue reading No Fixed Address. We are on page 67. I'm just going to read two chapters today. Um, there's not going to be anything assignment to do. Um, you could draw if, as I read if that helps you focus or just listen to the words. It's up to you today. Anyway, here we go. <clears throat> as September drew to a close, it got colder, especially at night. This is something you become acutely aware of when you live in a van. But we adapted. As Astrid likes to say, living in the West Westphalia definitely makes you a person more resourceful. Resourceful Felix is a good life skill to have. And we were nothing if not resourceful. Take Wi-Fi, for example. When we need it, we go to a coffee shop or find unsecured network. When some something needs recharging, like a phone or batteries for our headlamps, we plug in somewhere like the laundromat Sometimes we plug in at the power source outside an empty house. On the west side of Vancouver, there are lots of big, brand new houses with no one living in them. Astrid says they are investment properties. It's one of her pet peeves. Our city is becoming a playground for the rich. The enormous empty homes when so many people who live here can't afford, afford, can't afford affordable housing. Our politicians should be ashamed of themselves, ashamed of themselves, she says, over and over and over and over. Astrid is very good at picking out which houses are people free. The blinds are drawn, check. Lights go on at the same time every night, check. Junk mail piles up, check. Sprinkler system on even if it's pouring rain with zero consideration for water conservation, check. It is surprisingly easy to pull up outside one of these houses as darkness falls and use their electricity. We fill up our water containers with the outdoor hoses at the same time. We've never broken in, unless you count, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We were also resourceful when it came, comes to food. As a Westphalia kitchen is pint size, the tiny two burner stovetop doesn't allow for elaborate meals. And so we can't keep much stuff in the teensy fit fridge. So we eat a lot of stuff from cans, Habitat soup, vegetarian chili. My mom even lets me eat Chef Boyardee once in a while, even though she says it's toxic waste. But to be clear, I'm not malnourished. Not too badly, anyway. I don't think I'm suffering from scurvy or vitamin deficiency or anything like that. We shop at No Frills, where you can get really good deals on produce they're about to throw out. And once in a while, my mom will. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. I won't lie. Some aspects of life in the West Valley never get easier. Like not having a bathroom. I miss more than anything. Miss that more than anything. We always try to stop for the night near a public restroom. We do our business in coffee shops or McDonald's restaurants, which have nice facilities. We do a lot of armpit and bit washing in sinks. Twice a week, we go to the community center and have long showers. We do our best, but still, what I wouldn't give for a toilet to call my own. There's also a lack of privacy. Two people in a small space like that, I dare anyone to try it and not get into a, on your nerves once in a while. It doesn't help that my mom snores like a trucker sometimes, even though she totally denies it. And let's say there are certain things an almost 13 year old boy will occasionally like to do private and very personal things that are impossible when the almost 13 year old's mother is sleeping three feet away. That is all I want to say about that. But in September, we were sure our living arrangement was temporary. And so we managed. My mom moved the West Valley every few nights so we wouldn't arouse suspicion. I secured Mel to the dashboard so he could watch over us. And on the days we couldn't shower at the community center, I headed to school early and locked myself in the handicapped washroom, which was private and spacious. I kept a small toiletry kit, kit in my locker with soap and deodorant, a spare toothbrush and toothpaste. I'd peel off my shirt and give my armpit armpits a good thorough wash. I'd scrub my face and, br face and brush my teeth and comb my hair. And every time I was at Dylan's house, I would make sure to use his toilet to do a number two. I told myself it wasn't gross. I told myself it was resourceful. And then the day came that I told Dylan and Winnie my first, no one, no one gets hurt. It was Friday and our articles were due on Monday. So we agreed to get together over the weekend to do our final edits. We can't go to my place, Dylan said. A bunch of our relatives are visiting from back east. He looked at me. Could we go to yours? I live pretty far. That's okay, said Winnie. We can bus. I opened my mouth and closed my mouth. Then I heard myself say, my mom's got the flu, vomiting, diarrhea, the works. 
Winnie's mouth found formed a little O oh, in horror. Well then, you can come to mine. She gave me a stern look. But if you're contagious, I will murder you. Dylan and I took the bus together to Winnie's place on Saturday. It was a brand new eight-story building on 1st Street and 7th Avenue. She buzzed us up. Take off your shoes, she whispered as she opened the door. She guided us to a narrow hallway into her living room. It looked like something out of an Ikea catalog, only not as tidy. Sliding glass doors led to a balcony with views over the ocean and the North Shore Mountains. A pretty jade bird sat on the mantel above the fireplace. I have, have a seat, she whispered again. Is there a reason we're whispering? I asked in a whisper. Taking half of the love seat while Dylan took the other half. My mom's sleeping. She's an obstetrician. She delivered two babies last night. Winnie said this with pride. Dad's a nurse. They met during a C-section 15 years ago. Dad helped mom pull the baby out. Pretty romantic, don't you think? Dylan made a face. Pretty gross. We went to her through our pieces one last time, arguing in whispers. Your articles are silly, Winnie said. Your articles, your articles are snore fest. She ignored our comments and we ignored hers. But we did let her correct our spelling and gram grammatical errors because there were loads of them. Mr. Wu came in when we were fishing up. He was tall and skinny and had a friendly smile. His arms were weighed down with the bags of groceries. Would your friends like some lunch? He asked also in whisper, I just got back from the TNT supermarket. My stomach growled loudly in response. Astrid and I had eaten day old do donuts from the coffee shop for breakfast, but that was hours ago. Winnie jumped up. I could make sandwiches with my homemade bread. Ten minutes later, the four of us were crowded into their tiny kitchen, which was still 20 times bigger than the Westphalia's. Winnie served cheese sandwiches. You really make the bread, I asked. It looked delicious. She nodded. I started last year after I read an article about all the preservatives in Starbot. This one's gluten-free with quinoa and chia seeds. I took a big bite and started to chew. It took all my willpower not to spit it out. That bread tasted like sawdust and the consistency of tree bark. I could tell from, by D from Dylan's face that he was struggling too. Winnie held out a plate to her dad. You sure you won't want to have one? Mr. Wu patted his stomach. Wish I could. Still stuck from the late breakfast. Honey, do you mind getting the, my water glass? I left it in the other room. The moment she was gone, he motioned to us. Quick, take the cheese and hand me the bread. We did what we were told. He wolfed down the cheese while he slipped the bread into the garbage, making sure to put the other items on top of it. When Winnie return, returned, he told a give piece a chance. Your friends are bottomless pits. I'm making them a lunch number two. Steamed pork buns, anyone? Bah, which I haven't, what I haven't said about pork, Winnie chastised. Once in a while, I need my fix, he said. I ate four of them. They were legit delicious. Mr. Roo seemed to be a very good dad. Before Dylan and I left, I used the bathroom. It was white and clean and smelled like lavender potpourri. potpourri. They even had a heated toilet seat. I sat there for a long time feeling the warmth, warmth radiate through my bum. Then suddenly out of nowhere, tears trick, prick, prickled my eyes. I longed for a toilet. I longed for my dad. The first edition of the Blenheim Bugle came out on Wednesday. Monsieur Thibault gave us time to read it before lunch. It was eight pages, with the three French pages at the end. My article was featured first. It tried to, I try, I'll try to translate it from memory. It went something like this. Fun French Facts, Part 1, by Felix Knudsen. The French invented many things. The Braille system, pasteurization, hot air balloons. But I'm going to tell you about their a bloodier invention, the guillotine. It was made by a doctor named Joseph Ignace Guillotine in the late 1700s. He was against capital punishment. He made the guillotine because it was a nicer way to execute someone than with a sword or an axe. He was very sad when it was named after him. The guillotine chopped off tens of thousands of heads. Executions were big public events. People brought picnics and bought programs with the names of those about to be killed. The guillotine chopped off the heads of Louis VIII Louis XIII and Marie Antoinette at the end of the French Revolution. It was used for the last time in 1977, etc. Dylan's article came next. Poltergeist, fact or fiction by Dylan Brinkerkopf. Poltergeist means noisy ghost in German. Poltergeists are different from regular ghosts because they can move through, thing, through things 
and even throw things. Some think some people think they mean harm, but maybe some of them do. But our poltergeist does not. That is right. We have a poltergeist. His name is Bernard. He is sometimes annoying, but I think he likes being part of our family. I think he protects us in his own way, etc. Dylan and I had to look a lot of the words up and keep grammar, grammar simple because we didn't have a big French vocabulary yet. My simple crossword rounded out the second page. Winnie's article was last. Because it was so long, Charlie had made it single space to fit. Everything you need to know about asbestos and mesothelamia by Winnie Wu. Mesothelamia is a cancerous tumor which starts in the cells of the mesothelium. It is, what is the mesothelium, you ask? Well, it's a membrane that protects a lot of your internal organs. The one that protects our lungs is called the pleura. Actually, there are two layers. The inner layer is called the visceral pleura, and the outer, outer layer is called the partial pleura. Anyway, they are made up of cells. Those cells are called the mesothelia cells, and sometimes they act up. They change and sometimes turns into cancerous cells. Why does this happen? Well, guess what? The culprit is often asbestos. Asbestos fibers are very fine, and when somebody breathes them in, they can get in, you guessed it, the mesothelium. The link between asbestos and mesothelia has been known for years and lots of people die from it. And even though it is now illegal in Canada, we should support, we export it to other countries, which in in this reporter's opinion is sick and wrong, but also newsflash, it is still in the walls of many old buildings and newsflash, that includes our very own school. Winnie's article went on and on from there with big words that no one but she and Marcia Thibault could understand. When the bell rang for lunch, a bunch of kids came up to Dylan and me to tell us they enjoyed our articles and I had been and I had been able to follow them. And I had been able to follow them. One girl, Sophie, fell into a deep conversation with Dylan about the paranormal. Sometimes my camera sits in my bed in the middle of the night, I heard her say. She's been dead for five years. No one said a word to Winnie, except for Donald. Your article was amazing, he said as he walked past her desk. Amazingly stupid. He and his friend Vlad cracked up. Winnie's shoulders drooped. She scurried out of the room. Dylan and Sophie had moved onto the subject of Ouija boards, and so I told them I'd see them in the cafeteria. Winnie was sitting at the table by herself, eating an egg and bean sprout sandwich. I felt a twinge of pity, so I sat down across from her. I thought your article was very informative, I said. To my utter horror, her eyes filled with tears. Whoa, don't cry. Last year, I was diagnosed with dyscalculia. That, what's awful? That's, that's, is it terminal? She gave me a sharp word. No, you dummy. It's like math dyslexia. I flunked out of Kuman, and the year before that, I was asked not to sign up for ballet lessons because I was too clumsy. She blew her nose into a Kleenex. You think I'm this totally perfect person? No, 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 I don't. Not even close. But I'm not. There were so many things I'm lousy at, and I just, I thought journalism was my thing, you know? I thought this was the thing I was good at, aside from languages, I guess. When you come on, it's just one article. One article on a very important subject, which nobody read. She sighed. No one wants to think anymore. No one wants to read anything that matters. Maybe you need to hook them some more. You know, like if the headline had been, is your school killing you? And next time maybe simplify. You dump a whole bunch of big words on your reader. Even in English, it would have been hard to follow. She stopped crying. In other words, you want me to pander to the lowest common denominator? Her voice was icy. The lowest? What? She stood up and slapped her hands down on the table. I refuse to be part of the dumbing down of North America. Then she grabbed her gross sandwich and flounced off away in her plaid skirt. I didn't feel sorry for her anymore. After school, I didn't go to Dylan's place for once. Instead, I walked all the way to Bean there, Donut that, with a copy of the paper under my arm. Bells jingled over the door as I walked in. The walls were painted bright yellow, making it feel warm and inviting. Astor gave me a wave. She was behind the counter, making a fancy coffee for a customer. I put the paper down beside the machine. Is this what I think it is, she asked. I nodded. She stopped what she was doing and started reading. After a moment, the customer cleared his throat. Astrid waved the paper in his direction. My kid's a published journalist. She abandoned the coffee machine altogether and came around the 
pound her to give me a hug. I'm so proud of you, Felix. It's excellent. The customer cleared his throat again, louder this time. Astrid rolled her eyes. Some people should learn how to meditate, she said, loud enough for him to hear. She finished making his coffee once he'd left, muttering under his breath. It was just the two of us. I'm going to make you a hot chocolate, she said, with extra whipped cream, because I have good news, too. My heart did a little flip in my chest. Is this about a place you, we saw? On Sunday, we had seen an apartment for rent, one that we both really liked. It was a garden suite, which is a fancy way of saying basement. But it was clean and had lots of window and it was close to the school. Yep. The landlord called and he said it's ours if we want it. He just has to call my boss, get a reference. In a week, I'll be able to show him my pay stub. Since we were celebrating, Astrid let me, Astrid let me eat Chef Boyardee for dinner when we got to the van. We had day-old oat fudge bars from the coffee shop for dessert. Horatio loved the oats too, so I fed him quite a bit. We were both giddy when we thought about having our own place again. And as we lay in our beds in the dark, we talked about... What we look forward to most having a bathtub said astrid having a toilet i said and also me and also for me no more lies i thought i didn't want to be lying to dylan or to winnie soon i'd have our friend over anytime i wanted after i turned out my headlamp i only made it halfway through the listing of the Nobel peace prize winners in my head before i fell into a deep uninterrupted sleep i went to dylan's house after school the next day and by the time i got back to the van it was close to six o'clock Astrid usually didn't get home until 6.30, so I let myself in with the key. She was curled up in the back seat, sleeping on her bag wrapped around her. Astrid, she didn't an answer. I thought you were working till 6. I was supposed to. Her voice muffled through the sleeping bag. Oh, no. My P.O.O. told me something very wrong. What happened? My boss read all those lousy reviews about a new barista with a bad attitude online. I told him it wasn't my job to be nice to jerks. And he said it was, and then he fired me. My skin felt all clammy all of a sudden. What about the apartment? My land, the landlord, call, landlord called the shop for reference five minutes after I got fired. Oh, I'm sorry, Felix. I really am. I crawled into the van and closed the door against the rain. I sat beside my mom and rubbed her back. Then I took Horatio out of his cage and held him close. His whiskers tickled my face. I glanced up and saw Mal on the da dashboard. I could have sworn he was staring right at me. We would not be moving out of our West Westphalia. Not yet. Okay, that's the end of that section. And next time we read, we're actually going to start the next section called October. I hope you guys have a great long weekend. And I miss you. And we'll talk again next week. Bye-bye.